The popular modern scientific materialist atheist worldview propagated by NASA, the mainstream media, and the public education system is that you are here because nothingness, for no reason, exploded and created everything. Before time, space, matter, consciousness, intelligence, and life, there was nothing. Then the nothingness exploded. And instead of destroying things like every other explosion ever, this explosion created things created everything. The nothingness explosion somehow created space, time, and all matter in the universe in an instant and for no reason at all. Then all of the creationary explosive debris flying outward at over 670 million miles per hour for 14 billion years culminated to create you. Yes, first some of the more gaseous nothing came together forming suns and stars, then solid pieces of the nothing came together, forming planets and moons. Then the nothing turned hydrogen and oxygen came together, forming water on the nothing planet Earth, out of which single-celled living organisms magically appeared, got to work dividing and multiplying into multi-celled conscious organisms, which multiplied and divided and mutated into various forms of sea life, which adapted and evolved and crawled onto land, replacing gills with lungs, lost tails, grew opposable thumbs, and started grasping at straws like this ridiculous nihilistic notion of Big Bang evolution. This anti-God materialist theory of evolution has been staunchly protected by the infallibility of science for over 150 years, but in actual fact, just as science has failed to find one true, valid proof that Earth is a ball spinning around the sun, scientists have failed to discover a single piece of evidence that the material world is a product of blind chance evolution. Furthermore, Big Bang evolution actually requires and presupposes many other claims which have already been proven false in previous chapters, such as the plurality of worlds, Newton's theory of gravity, Einstein's theory of relativity, stars being distant suns, and Earth being a planet, not a plane. Harun Yahya wrote, Evolutionary theory claims that life started with the cell that formed by chance. According to this scenario, four billion years ago, various lifeless chemical compounds underwent a reaction in the primordial atmosphere on the Earth in which the effects of thunderbolts and atmospheric pressure led to the formation of the first living cell. The first thing that must be said is that the claim that inanimate materials can come together to form life is an unscientific one that has not been verified by any experiment or observation. Life is only generated from life. Each living cell is formed by the replication of another cell. No one in the world has ever succeeded in forming a living cell by bringing inanimate materials together, not even in the most advanced laboratories. The theory of evolution faces no greater crisis than on the point of explaining the emergence of life. The reason is that organic molecules are so complex that their formation cannot possibly be explained as being coincidental, and it is manifestly impossible for an organic cell to have been formed by chance. How could all the interconnected and compartmentalized components, the cell wall, the cell membrane, the mitochondria, proteins, DNA, RNA, ribosomes, lysosomes, cytoplasm, vacuoles, nucleus, and other cell parts magically come together and create conscious intelligent life from unconscious dead matter. Just making one average sized protein molecule is already composed of 288 amino acids of 12 varying types which can be combined to 10 to the 300th power different ways. Of all those possibilities, only one forms the desired protein molecule, and there are over 600 types of proteins combined in the smallest bacteria ever discovered. Astronomer Fred Hoyle compared the odds that all the multifaceted and multifunctional parts of a cell could coincidentally come together and create life analogous to a tornado sweeping through a junkyard and assembling a Boeing 747 from the materials therein. Hoyle wrote that, if there were a basic principle of matter which somehow drove organic systems toward life, its existence should easily be demonstrable in the laboratory. One could, for instance, take a swimming bath to represent the primordial soup 
fill it with any chemicals of a non-biological nature you please, pump any gases over it or through it you please, and shine any kind of radiation on it that takes your fancy. Let the experiment proceed for a year and see how many of those 2,000 enzymes, protein produced by living cells, have appeared in the bath. I will give the answer, and so save all the time and trouble and expense of actually doing the experiment. You will find nothing at all, except possibly for a tarry sludge composed of amino acids and other simple organic chemicals. Even if scientists placed all the chemical substances necessary for life in a tank, applied to them any processes of their choice, and waited for billions of years, not a single living cell could or would ever form. Astrobiologist Chandra Wikraman Singh wrote, The likelihood of the spontaneous formation of life from inanimate matter is one to a number with 40,000 zeros after it. It is big enough to bury Darwin in the whole theory of evolution. The beginnings of life were not random. They must have been the product of purposeful intelligence. From my earliest training as a scientist, I was very strongly brainwashed to believe that science cannot be consistent with any kind of deliberate creation. That notion has had to be painfully shed. At the moment, I can't find any rational argument to knock down the view which argues for conversion to God. We used to have an open mind. Now we realize that the only logical answer to life is creation, and not accidental random shuffling. Harun Yahya wrote, Scientific proofs from such branches of science as paleontology, microbiology, and anatomy reveal evolution to be a bankrupt theory. It has been stressed that evolution is incompatible with scientific discoveries, reason, and logic. Those who believe in the theory of evolution think that a few atoms and molecules thrown into a huge vat could produce thinking, reasoning professors, university students, scientists, artists, antelopes, lemon trees, and carnations. Moreover, the scientists and professors who believe in this nonsense are educated people. That is why it is quite justifiable to speak of the theory of evolution as the most potent spell in history. Never before has any other belief or idea so taken away people's powers of reason, refused to allow them to think intelligently and logically, and hidden the truth from them as if they had been blindfolded. Consciousness, life, the beautiful diversity, complexity, and interconnectedness of nature and the universe simply could not be the result of some random coincidental physical phenomenon. If the likelihood of life forming from inanimate matter is 1 to the 10 to the 40,000th power, then those are precisely the magnificent odds against which the universe could be unintelligently designed. Even the simple formation of DNA and RNA molecules are similarly beyond the reach of chance to come together, equivalent to 1 times 10 to the 600th power, or 10 with 600 zeros afterwards. Such a mathematical improbability actually so closely borders the impossible that the word improbable becomes misleading. Mathematicians who regularly work with these infinitesimally small numbers say anything beyond 10 to the 50th power should be considered, for all intents and purposes, impossible. Dr. Leslie Orgel, an associate of Francis Crick, the discoverer of DNA, wrote, It is extremely improbable that proteins and nucleic acids, both of which are structurally complex, arose spontaneously in the same place at the same time yet it also seems impossible to have one without the other. And so, at first glance, one might have to conclude that life could never, in fact, have originated by chemical means. Or as Turkish evolutionist professor Ali Demirsoy stated, the probability of the coincidental formation of cytochrome C, just one of the essential proteins for life, is as unlikely as the possibility of a monkey writing the history of humanity on a typewriter without making any mistakes. Some metaphysical powers beyond our definition must have acted in its formation. Harun Yahya wrote, Let us suppose that millions of years ago a cell was formed which had acquired everything necessary for life, and that it duly came to life. The theory of evolution again collapses at this point, for even if this cell had existed for a while, it would eventually have died, and after its death, nothing would have remained, and everything would have been reverted to where it had started. This is because the first living cell, lacking any genetic information, would not have been able to reproduce and start a new generation. 
life would have ended with its death. The genetic system does not only consist of DNA, the following things must also exist in the same environment. Enzymes to read the code on the DNA, messenger RNA to be produced after reading these codes, a ribosome to which messenger RNA will attach according to this code, transfer RNA to transfer the amino acids to the ribosome for use in production, and extremely complex enzymes to carry out numerous intermediary processes. Such an environment cannot exist anywhere apart from a totally isolated and completely controlled environment, such as the cell, where all the essential raw materials and energy resources exist. The Big Bang theory is easily proven false, as the nature of explosions is to destroy, to break things down into their constituent parts, increasing chaos and decreasing order. Explosions simply do not and cannot create things, causing disparate parts to combine into more ordered wholes as the Big Bang theory contends. Similarly, the theory of evolution is proven false by entropy, the second law of thermodynamics. It is a fact that systems left to their own devices tend to become corrupted, disordered, and dispersed over time. All things, living or not, wear out, deteriorate, and decay. They do not spontaneously come together over time in incredibly implausible combinations, creating diverse, complex, and beautiful living forms. Thus, the theory of evolution is in direct opposition to the law of entropy. Evolution supposes things become more ordered, more structured, and more complex over time. But from rust to mold to rotting corpses, nature is everywhere at odds with such a notion. Furthermore, according to the Le Chatelier principle in chemistry, life could not have been formed in the sea as evolutionists allege anyway, since the peptide bond created by amino acid chains produces water molecules, it is not possible for such a reaction to take place in a hydrous environment. Harun Yahya wrote, Organic matter can self-reproduce only if it exists as a fully developed cell with all its organelles in an appropriate environment where it can survive, exchange materials, and get energy from its surroundings. This means that the first cell on Earth was formed all of a sudden, together with its amazingly complex structure. What would you think if you went out hiking in the depth of a thick forest and ran across a brand new car among the trees? Would you imagine that various elements in the forest had come together by chance over millions of years and produced such a vehicle? All the parts in the car are made of products such as iron, copper, and rubber, the raw ingredients for which are all found on the earth. But would this fact lead you to think that these materials had synthesized by chance and then come together and manufactured such a car? There is no doubt that anyone with a sound mind would realize that the car was a product of an intelligent design, in other words, a factory, and wonder what it was doing there in the middle of the forest. The sudden emergence of a complex structure in a complete form, quite out of the blue, shows that this is the work of an intelligent agent. An extraordinarily complex system like the cell is no doubt created by a superior will and wisdom. In other words, it came into existence as a creation of God. Many facets of nature are far too complex, specialized, and perfect to have arisen simply due to blind chance changes over time. For example, the eye, with its various parts and mechanisms all working together with the brain producing the sharpest, clearest 3D color images imaginable. Even the most advanced cameras and plasma screens ever produced by humans cannot provide an image as perfect in detail and clarity as our own eyes. Charles Darwin, the originator of the theory of evolution himself, admitted that the thought of the eye made him cold all over, as he knew what an impassable obstacle the eye presented for his theory. And it is the same with ears and audio equipment. For over a century, many thousands of researchers, scientists, and engineers have been working in factories across the world trying to produce sharper, clearer audio and video playing and recording devices, never coming close to the capabilities and perfection of the human ear and eye. Harun Yahya wrote, Look at the book you read, your hands with which you hold it, then lift your head and look around you. Have you ever seen such a sharp and distinct image as this one at any other place? Even the most developed television screen produced by the greatest television producer in the world cannot provide such a sharp image for you. This is a three-dimensional, colored, and extremely sharp image. No one would say that a hi-fi or a camera came into being as a result of chance. 
So how can it be claimed that the technologies that exist in the human body, which are superior even to these, could have come into being as a result of a chain of coincidences called evolution? It is evident that the eye, the ear, and indeed all the parts of the human body are products of a very superior creation. Charles Darwin, in his Origin of Species, the veritable Bible of atheist materialists, stated that, If my theory be true, numberless intermediate varieties, linking most closely all of the species of the same group together, must assuredly have existed. Consequently, evidence of their former existence could be found only amongst fossil remains. Darwin himself knew no such transitional forms had been discovered, and hoped that they would be found in the future. He even admitted in his Difficulties on the Theory chapter that these missing intermediate forms were the biggest stumbling block for his theory. He called it the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. Harun Yahya wrote, According to the theory of evolution, every living species has emerged from a predecessor. One species which existed previously turned into something else over time, and all species have come into being in this way. According to the theory, this transformation proceeds gradually over millions of years. If this were the case, then innumerable intermediary species should have lived during the immense period of time when these transformations were supposedly occurring. For instance, there should have lived in the past some half-fish, half-reptile creatures which had acquired some reptilian traits in addition to the fish traits which they already had or there should have existed some reptile bird creatures which had acquired some avian traits in addition to the reptilian traits they already possessed. Evolutionists refer to these imaginary creatures, which they believe to have lived in the past, as transitional forms. If such animals had really existed, there would have been millions, even billions of them. More importantly, the remains of these creatures should be present in the fossil record. The number of these transitional forms should have been even greater than that of present animal species, and their remains should be found all over the world. Darwin hoped that transitional forms of animal species gradually evolving into different species would eventually be discovered at some future time in the fossil record. To this day, however, no such transitional forms have ever been found anywhere in the world. Darwin's observations regarding natural selection and adaptation were certainly correct so-called microevolution of various traits and characteristics within a species has been confirmed and widely exists. But macroevolution, the supposed transformation from one species into a completely different species, has never been observed, and no evidence of such evolution exists anywhere in the fossil record. Colin Patterson, senior paleontologist for the British Museum of Natural History and an ardent evolutionist, even he admits that Darwinists must concede natural selection has never been observed to actually cause anything to evolve. He said, No one has ever produced a species by mechanism of natural selection. No one has ever got near it, and most of the current argument in Neo-Darwinism is about this question. Harun Yahya wrote, even in the most scientific books about evolution, the stage of transition from water to land, one of the unexplainable points of evolution, is given in such simplicity that they do not prove to be believable even for children. According to evolution, life began in water, and the first developed animals on earth were fish. According to the story, one day fish species developed the ability to climb out of the water and moved on land. The theory continues that fish which chose to live on land had feet instead of fins, and lungs instead of gills. In most of the books about evolution, nobody explains why the transition occurred. Even in the most scientific sources, writers suddenly jump to conclusions like, and transition from water to land occurred, without providing a satisfactory answer regarding how the process worked. Yet, how did this transformation occur? It is obvious that a fish cannot survive out of water for more than one or two minutes. If we assume that a drought really existed, as claimed by evolutionists, and fish were, for some reason, drawn to lands, then what would happen to fish even if this process lasts for ten millions of years? The answer is straight. Fish leaving the water would inevitably die in a few moments. Even if this process lasted for ten million years, the answer would still be the same all fish would die one by one. Nobody would dare say, maybe after four million years, 
some of the fish suddenly acquired lungs while they were trying to survive. This would no doubt be an illogical assertion. However, that is exactly what evolutionists claim. The theory of evolution supposes that life somehow originated and evolved in the sea until somehow something that had theretofore lived only underwater grew lungs and feet and started living on land. Darwinists claim fish, creatures living only underwater, turned into amphibians, creatures living on both land and water, and then amphibians evolved into reptiles, creatures living only on land. Then they propose some reptiles evolved wings and became birds, while other reptiles evolved and became mammals. None of these transitional forms have ever been found, however, nor could they realistically exist either. For example, amphibian eggs develop only in water, whereas amniotic eggs develop only on land, so some sort of gradual step-by-step -step evolution scenario is impossible, since without perfect, complete eggs, a species cannot survive. Reptiles, allegedly evolving into mammals, is another example of evolutionist wishful thinking. Reptiles are cold-blooded, lay eggs, do not suckle their young, have one middle ear bone, three mandible bones, and bodies covered in scales, whereas mammals are warm-blooded, have live births, suckle their young, have three middle ear bones, one mandible, and are covered in fur or hair. Far too many distinct differences for gradual evolution. Reptiles evolving wings is another sheer impossibility, as the structure of land-dwelling reptiles and air-dwelling birds are far too different. Engin Quirr, a Turkish evolutionist, admits the problem wings present to Darwin's theory. The common trait of the eyes and the wings is that they can only function if they are fully developed. In other words, a halfway developed eye cannot see. A bird with half-formed wings cannot fly. How these organs came into being has remained one of the mysteries of nature that needs to be enlightened. Harun Yahya wrote, Although it is cloaked in the guise of science, the theory of evolution is nothing but a deceit, a deceit defended only for the benefit of materialistic philosophy, a deceit based not on science but on brainwashing propaganda and fraud. The theory of evolution is a theory that fails from the very first step. The reason is that evolutionists are unable to explain even the formation of a single protein. Neither the laws of probability nor the laws of physics and chemistry offer any chance for the fortuitous formation of life. Does it sound logical or reasonable when not even a single chance-formed protein can exist that millions of such proteins combined in an order to produce the cell of a living thing and that billions of cells manage to form and then come together by chance to produce living things and that from them generated fish and that those that passed to land turned into reptiles, birds, and that this is how all the millions of different species on earth were formed? They have never found a single transitional form such as a half-fish, half-reptile, or half-reptile, half-bird, nor have they been able to prove that a protein or even a single amino acid molecule composing a protein could have formed under what they call primordial earth conditions. Not even in their elaborately equipped laboratories have they succeeded in doing that. Darwin's theory is a concept that concerns not only biology, chemistry, astronomy, and metaphysics, but actually formed the basis for a new political outlook as well. Within a very short time, this new progressive political attitude was redefined as social Darwinism, and as many historians have suggested, social Darwinism became the ideological basis of fascism, communism, and eugenics. Darwin's idea of natural selection and survival of the fittest were central to the insane ideologies of many of the 20th century's worst mass murderers, including Mao, Stalin, Lenin, Trotsky, Marx, and Pol Pot. Charles Darwin himself was a blatant racist who elucidated in his book The Descent of Man how blacks and aborigines, due to their inferiority to Caucasians, would be done away with by the civilized races in time. Freemasonic records state that Charles Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, was a philosopher, scientist, and physician who advanced ideas on evolution back in the 18th century. Before coming to Derby in 1788, Dr. Darwin had been made a mason in the famous Time Immemorial Lodge of Canongate Kilwinning No. 2 of Scotland. He also maintained close connections to the Jacobin Masons in France and Adam Weishaupt's Illuminati. Sir Francis Darwin and Reginald Darwin, two of his sons, were also made Masons in Tyrian Lodge No. 253 at Derby. 
Charles Darwin does not appear on the rolls of the lodge, but it is most likely that he, like his grandfather, his sons, and his bulldog, T. H. Huxley, was a mason. Charles wrote that he used to listen to his grandfather's ideas of evolution and was greatly influenced by them. Erasmus was the first man to put forward the notion of evolution in England. He was known as a respected person, but he had a very dark private life, and at least two illegitimate children. Charles himself would go on to marry his first cousin and have three children die due to complications from inbreeding. Harun Yahya wrote, Masons, thinking that Darwinism could serve their goals, played a great role in its dissemination among the masses. As soon as Darwin's theory was published, a group of volunteer propagandists formed around it, the most famous of whom was Thomas Huxley, who was called Darwin's Bulldog. Huxley, whose ardent advocacy of Darwinism was the single factor most responsible for its rapid acceptance, brought the world's attention to the theory of evolution in the debate at the Oxford University Museum in which he entered into on June 30th, 1860 with the Bishop of Oxford, Samuel Wilberforce. Huxley's great dedication to spreading the idea of evolution, together with his establishment connections, is brought into further light according to the following fact. Huxley was a member of the Royal Society, one of England's most prestigious scientific institutions, and, like nearly all the other members of this institution, was a senior mason. Other members of the Royal Society lent Darwin significant support. In short, Darwin wasn't acting alone. From the moment his theory was proposed, he received the support that came from the social classes and groups whose nucleus was made up of masons. An important example which proves the fact that Darwinism is one of the biggest deceptions of atheistic Freemasonry is a resolution carried in a Mason meeting. The 33rd degree Supreme Council of Mizram Freemasonry at Paris reveals in its minutes its promotion of evolution as science, while they themselves scoffed at the theory. The minutes read as follows. It is with this object in view, the scientific theory of evolution, that we are constantly, by means of our press, arousing a blind confidence in these theories. The intellectuals will puff themselves up with their knowledge, and without any logical verification of them, will put into effect all the information available from science, which our agentura specialists have cunningly pieced together for the purpose of educating their minds in the direction we want. Do not suppose for a moment that these statements are empty words. Think carefully of the successes we arranged for Darwinism. Atheistic Freemasonry in the United States has picked up the resolution of Mizram before long. New Age magazine in its March 1922 issue stated that the kingdom of atheistic Freemasonry will be established by evolution and the development of man himself. As seen above, the false scientific image of evolution is a deception set in the 33rd degree atheist Masonic lodges. Atheist Masons openly admit that they will use the scientists and media which are under their control to present this deception as scientific, which even they find funny. The Mimar Sinan journal, published by the Turkish Great Freemasonry Lodge, has openly discussed their mission to use Darwinism to overthrow religion and belief in God. One article mentioned, Today, the only valid scientific theory accepted both by most civilized countries and underdeveloped ones remains to be Darwinism. However, neither the church nor other religions have collapsed yet. The legend of Adam and Eve is still being taught as religious teaching in holy books. In other words, it seems that one of the main goals of modern Masons, besides convincing people of the ball earth and Big Bang, is to abolish creationism and replace it with their godless myth of blind chance evolution. Just like Copernicus never claimed to have any new or special evidence for his heliocentric theory, Darwin never claimed to have any verifiable scientific evidence proving his evolution theory, yet here we are 150 years later, no closer to a proof of either, but with the vast majority of indoctrinated sheeple convinced they are monkey men hanging from a spinning ball. Harun Yahya wrote, When we look at the Western media carefully, we frequently come across news dwelling on the theory of evolution. Leading media organizations and well-known and respectable magazines periodically bring this subject up. When their approach is examined, one gets the impression that this theory is an absolutely proven fact, leaving no room for discussion. Ordinary people reading this kind of news naturally start to think that the theory of evolution is a fact as certain as any law of mathematics. They print headlines in big fonts. According to Time magazine, a new fossil that completes the gap in the fossil chain has been found. 
or Nature Indicates That Scientists Have Shed Light on the Final Issues of Evolutionary Theory. The finding of the last missing link of the evolution chain means nothing because there is not a single thing proven about evolution. In short, both the media and academic circles, which are at the disposal of anti-religionist power centers, maintain an entirely evolutionist view, and they impose this on society. This imposition is so effective that it has, in time, turned evolution into an idea that is never to be rejected. Denying evolution is seen as being contradictory to science and fundamental realities. The information we have considered throughout this book has shown us that the theory of evolution has no scientific basis, and that, on the contrary, evolutionist claims conflict with scientific facts. In other words, the force that keeps evolution alive is not science. The theory of evolution is maintained by some scientists, but behind it there is another influence at work. This other influence is materialist philosophy. Materialist philosophy is one of the oldest beliefs in the world, and assumes the existence of matter as its basic principle. According to this view, matter has always existed, and everything that exists consists of matter. This makes belief in a creator impossible, of course, because if matter has always existed, and if everything consists of matter, then there can be no supermaterial creator who created it. The fact of the matter is, evolution is, was, and always has been a foregone conclusion by people looking for any answer other than God. When you metaphysically exclude the existence of an intelligent, creative consciousness behind the creation of the material world, the only answer left is random happenstance. Everything must be the result of coincidence, chance, and circumstance once you have excluded the possibility of a supreme intelligent creator. But no matter how diligently it is denied, the truth remains. You simply are not some cosmic accident not the result of random happenstance, chance, or coincidence. Your eyes, your ears, your feelings, your life and consciousness are all the result of the most supremely intelligent design. My previous book, Spiritual Science, is a 284-page refutation of materialist science and philosophy, which proves far beyond any reasonable doubt that atheistic materialism is an invalid, untenable, destructive philosophy, and that consciousness and intelligence existed before and beyond all space, time, and matter. Malcolm Muggeridge, an atheist philosopher and supporter of evolution for 60 years, finally admitted before his death that, I myself am convinced that the theory of evolution, especially the extent to which it's been applied, will be one of the great jokes in the history books in the future. Posterity will marvel that so very flimsy and dubious an hypothesis could be accepted with the incredible credulity that it has. Harun Yahya wrote, According to these professors, a number of simple chemical substances first came together and formed a protein which is no more possible than a randomly scattered collection of letters coming together to form a poem. Then, other coincidences led to the emergence of other proteins. These then also combined by chance in an organized manner, not just proteins, but DNA, RNA, enzymes, hormones, and cell organelles, all of which are very complex structures within the cell, coincidentally happen to emerge and come together. As a result of these billions of coincidences, the first cell came into being. If you put a carved stone or wooden idol in front of these people and told them, look, this idol created this room and everything in it, they would say that was utterly stupid and refuse to believe it. Yet, despite that, they declare the nonsense that the unconscious process known as chance gradually brought this world and all the billions of wonderful living things in it into being, to be the greatest scientific explanation. In short, these people regard chance as a god, and claim that it is intelligent, conscious, and powerful enough to create living things and all the sensitive balances in the universe.